גהיפ ועל בימה. Mirëmrama shiku së ndëruar të televizionit të shtatë, kjo është emisioni Presing. Akademiku Britanik, Sir Noel Malcolm, tashe dy dekada është referenca kryesorë për historin e Kosovës, shqiptarve, por edhe për Balkanin. Libri ti Kosova është i pati i kalu e shumë për këdo që dëshiron të mësoj për historin tonë. Në fakt, Malcolm në ka bërë një ndërë të malë se cilit prinesh, duke shkruar historin tonë të pangarkuar me subjektivizma dhe të shkruar në mënyrë profesionale. Sonte, Zoti Malcolm është në presing për diskutuar për shumë qështje dhe për t'ju përgjigjur plët dilemave që vazhdojnë të jenë preokupim i vazhdueshëm për ne Kosovarët, por edhe për njerëzit që interesohen për historin dhe politiken e vendit tonë. Zoti Malcolm, minë rama, knajsi që ju kam në studio. Falem derit dhe falim derit për ftesën. Më falni se do të flasë anglisht gjatë intervistës, sepse flasë shqipë vetëm rralë dhe besoj se nuk mund të shprehë mendimin tim plotësisht në gjuhën shqipe. Pra tjetër, do të bëjmë anglisht e pastaj gjithë shka do të titrohet nga stafi e misionit tonë. Zotim Malkom, do të nisim intervisten me një zbulim që ndodhe gjatë muajve të verës, pra në qytetin antik të Urpianës, u bë një prej zbulimeve më të rëndësish, me një mbëshkim monumental i një plakate ku shkrua në emri i Justinianit dhe emri Dardania. Besoj, jeni në djenit të kësaj dhe si duhet të kuptojmë, ose të interpretojmë ato që farë, u zbulua dhe që u tha që ishte jarë zakonishtë rëndësishme zbulimi që ndodhën e qytetin e antik të Ulpianës. I have to confess I was not aware of this, but I'm very interested to hear it. The Roman remains in this whole area are a very important witness of the deeply uh, European origins of this whole civilization. Uh, it was through the Roman Empire that um, the Albanian lands acquired Christianity at a very early stage, that the Albanian language acquired so many elements of vocabulary that come from the Latin. Um, this is of, of huge symbolic significance. Um, and of course, you know, I am not an archaeologist. My interest in history really starts after the Roman Empire with the Middle Ages, the Ottoman period. Um, but I think it is very important for every society mm -hmm. to know about its origins as far back as possible. And of course, in the case of the Albanians, uh, these are, apart from the Greeks, mm -hmm. the only people of the Balkans who have a clear origin in the pre-Roman uh, civilization, the pre-Roman societies, uh, in this case, as you say, Dardanians, uh, who were a branch of the Illyrians. Um, so this is an extremely important, uh, important matter, and I'm, I'm sure that archaeologists and, and ancient historians will be looking at the implications of this mm. very carefully. I ask you, I ask you, nëse shqiptarët janë pasardhës të dardaneve. Në fakt, për Kosovarët, për shqiptarët nuk është të diskutushme kjo, po në përfqinjet, sigurisht që është të diskutushme, pra nëse janë pasardhës të drejt për drejt. Dhe po shpërzoj rastin nga kësbulim, 
pra në qytetin e Ulpionës, që pysë edhe një herë, pra, a ka dyshime për ju, që pra prezenca, në fakt, shqiptarët jenë pasardhës të dardanëve? In my mind, the balance of probabilities is strongly in favor of that explanation. Uh, I have studied the evidence of the modern scholarship. As I say, I'm not a specialist in the ancient period, and I'm not a specialist in ancient linguistics. But basically, for these questions, you need two kinds of evidence, if possible. One is archaeological evidence of objects, preferably with inscriptions in the original language, and the other is the evidence of linguistics, which comes from analyzing place names, uh, particularly, and some personal names where we have records, for example, in Roman history of the names of Illyrian leaders. And the studies that have analyzed very carefully the place name evidence, which is probably the strongest form of evidence, have found clear connections between these ancient Illyrian place names uh, preserved through Latin and uh, the modern Albanian language. Now, mm -hmm. on the archaeological side, we do not have direct evidence that can prove that some physical remains were Illyrian. How would we prove that? Ideally, we would have inscriptions in the Illyrian language, but these do not exist. So the archaeological evidence can never be conclusive about the Illyrian dimension. But I think the linguistic evidence is very strong. Uh, and I've seen attempts by other scholars to pose different origin stories for the Albanians. These seem to be not convincing uh, and to raise more problems. So, what is the question for the Balkan? It is the same thing. It is the same thing. Well, as I said, every society needs to understand its origins. History is history. It, 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 it consists of facts which are there waiting to be understood, waiting to be interpreted. So this, just in a general cultural sense, is, is good and important to gain knowledge and understanding. Personally, I would say this is not something to use in a political way. Um, you know, I have seen so many cases in different countries where people say, oh, we were here first and therefore the other people are somehow in the wrong. Uh, I've seen this in Romania, a country where I've sp spent much time and done research. Uh, Romanians clinging to a myth which I think has been disproved, that they are all descended from Roman soldiers or ancient Dacians because they are obsessed with an argument about the Hungarian minority in Romania, and they want to say, oh, we were here first. These Hungarians came only in the ninth century, so they are new boys. They are uh, just sort of recent arrivals. Uh, to be honest, I think that whole political ideology is, is, is pointless. Uh, we live in the present. We live with people who live around us in the present. So I would never apply these arguments to present-day politics. But I think just as a historian, mm -hmm. I do feel strongly that it's important to understand everything about the past. You can uh, a shumë për mitet serbe, cilat uh, do t'i diskutojmë gjatë kësoj interviste, por fillemish duat ju pys për mitet shqiptare. A uh, janë edhe shqiptarët si pas jush uh, në kurthen e miteve të tyre? Well, every society, every culture is sort of inside its myths to some extent. You know, the French have myths about uh, Jeanne d'Arc, Joan of Arc. Um, Americans have their own myths of their hero founders. Um, this is normal. It is part of normal cultural life. And equally normal, I hope, is the fact that the job of historians is to challenge these myths and always to push people back towards the evidence. So do Albanians have myths? Uh, yes, I have addressed some in my book. Um, I think uh, 
Cilat janë kryesorët? Cilat janë midët kryesore të shqiptarëve? Well, I think probably the most general myth is that always Albanians were fighting for independence. Uh, in some cases this is true, but as I've argued in my book, the League of Prizren at the beginning was not an independence movement. It was a movement to preserve a status quo which the Albanians of the Malasi uh, and the Kosovo region enjoyed under the Ottoman Empire, a status quo of de facto autonomy because they were very difficult to govern, difficult to tax, difficult to recruit soldiers from, and so they enjoyed a level of local freedom under the Ottoman system. And that essentially is what they were defending at that point, plus the important question of uh, giving some territory to Montenegro. But at the beginning, I think the League of Prisoners was not uh, a campaign for an independent nation. And it was the reaction of the Ottoman authorities and the gradual growth of influence of some of the more intellectual members of the League, the Frasheri brothers in particular. This gradually moved the aims and the nature of the League in the direction of independence. But at the beginning, I think it, it has been misrepresented. So that, that is a classic example because the League of Prizren has a sort of foundational character uh, when we look at modern Albanian independence. But I think often historians have looked at small rebellions, sometimes big rebellions before that, uh, particularly in, in northern, the northern part of Albania, the Malsi. And every time they see Albanians fighting against Ottomans, they say, aha, mm -hmm. this is national liberation. But national liberation is a phrase that comes to us, well, from, from nationalist modern historiography, from communist modern historiography. Sometimes people were reacting against a new tax or a new attempt to, to recruit soldiers. Um, so I'm not saying that no Albanians wanted an, Al uh, an independent state. There are examples of that, and they go back further. But I'm just saying the general tendency mm -hmm to attribute everything to a sort of single, uh, universal, timeless desire to campaign for independence. This is unhistorical. So you asked me to specify Albanian myths. I think that is probably the primary one that has shaped quite a lot of the writing of, of Albanian history. <laughs> Nuk është si këm, pra, që ka, që ka zhvillu shumë luftra, pra, ndalim prej serbe dhe tjerve, pra, nga pak shqiptarët për qmohën që gjatë historis, nuk u që kanë luftra shumë. Ju uh, e bot një sarim fakt me ato që farë ka ndodhë dhe që farë ka qenë lidhja për zrenit, ose edhe me levizje tjera gjatë pushtimit Osman, cilat uh, ju do më zdo shmërish kanë qenë kryngritje për pavarësi, po kanë qenë edhe për taksa ose për qështje tjera. Uh, kanë arsye shqiptarët krenohen ose të ndihen më të nënqmu me kombe tjera në aspektin e trimnis, po themi, edhe të luftrave që kanë zhvillu uh, gjatë historisë të tyre? Well, let me emphasize first what I just said about modern historiography misinterpreting everything in the past as one simple uh, struggle. I would say exactly the same thing about the historiography of the Serbs, the Bulgarians, uh, the Greeks. Um, my point was not specific to Albanians at all. It was a general point about how retrospectively there is this tendency to simplify everything to, to one theme. Uh, but you ask about Albanians fighting. I mean, the case of Skanderbeg, uh, was perhaps the most famous in the whole of Europe of resistance to the Ottoman state. Um, and Skanderbeg, it is a matter still of discussion among scholars what the long-term political purpose was, but this I think is a strong example of someone who did want independence from the Ottoman Empire. Um, whether he wanted it in the terms that we would 
think of now as a, a, a modern nation state, I'm not so sure, but it was certainly a major revolt uh, over many decades against the Ottoman Empire. And this created a reputation around the whole of Europe for the Albanians as heroes of uh, fighting against the Ottomans. And there were many subsequent cases. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think there's any lack of, of, of honor when one looks at the record in those terms. Okay. Si gazetar, so që së dhe kësaj dite, pra, edhe në këtë studio, ka debatët zjarta për shumë qështje që lidhen me historin, por edhe me personalitetet të ndryshme të historis, pra, së dhe kësaj dite. Ajo që, në fakt, sonde, bëdu me shpizu rastin, për mjë pyt disa prej atyre qështjeve që jenë jarë zakonisht të diskutushme, pra, tema që nëzisin debat të fuqishëm të këne dhe krysisht jenë që lidhen me parëndrin Osmane. Ndështëta të ngëllën që ditëshëm, po ka njërë së dhe kësaj dite që shtërojnë për diskutim edhe atë nëse ishte parëndria Osmane pushtuese në visët shqiptare, apo ishte administruese, ose po themi bashk administruese me popullësin e këtushme. Cilë është Vërzioni juj, i asaj, i kësaj qështje, pra? Well, it was certainly an external invader at the beginning. It was an occupying power at the beginning, but it became a stable administration, and this just set the framework for the existence of not only the Albanian people, but other Balkan peoples, for many hundreds of years. So, again, as a historian, I say we must accept the past. It happened. Uh, it's our job to understand it. Mm -hmm. But I'm aware there have been some modern political disputes um, about uh, whether the Ottoman heritage and, of course, especially the conversion to Islam of many people, whether this remains somehow alien. I think this is a false, a false approach. Um, we are what we are, mm -hmm. and that is shaped by many hundreds of years of history. Um, I remember years ago a debate among Albanian intellectuals here and in Albania uh, trying to, one side trying to argue that um, the whole Ottoman and Muslim heritage was alien to the real spirit of the Albanian people. Well, you could understand this then in political cultural terms. People wanted to reunite mm -hmm. with uh, Western European civilization, which they saw as Christian civilization. They said we were a typical medieval Christian society. Um, and everything went wrong when we were conquered by these alien Turks and so on. And now we want to forget all that and start again as if it never happened. I'm exaggerating a little, but, but that was the mentality. Oh. And my honest feeling about that is this is not realistic. Imagine if you went to mm -hmm. a country in South America and you said, well, this terrible thing happened. Christopher Columbus arrived and then Spanish soldiers and this is why we speak Spanish and this is why we go to a Christian church. You know, would it be serious politics to say, oh, well, all of this is wrong and alien and we must just, you know, pretend it never happened and just eliminate 500 years of our culture? It's, it, it, it's not realistic. We are what we are. So the, to go back to your question, the Ottoman state was in some ways... Um, an administrative machine which did not make very strong demands on the people that it ruled. Basically, it wanted money uh, from rents and taxes, and it wanted men for its army. Beyond that, it was not trying to turn everyone into Turks. It was not even trying to turn everyone into Muslims. Conversion was not a state policy. Um, as you know, Christians, both Catholic and Orthodox, and Jews were allowed to continue to administer their own uh, church communities, even in matters of law, some matters of law, 
to administer those for themselves. So it was not a, 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 a heavy burden. Uh, it did what it did, and over time it did it less efficiently, and so there was more corruption and more abuse of power. And it's understandable, particularly in the Albanian lands, uh, that some of this was resented, especially where the treatment of education was concerned. Um, for reasons that are still a little obscure, there was a policy of not promoting education in the Albanian language, and I think that was a significant difference between the treatment of the Albanian lands and the treatment of, for example, Serbia or Greece. Um, so yes, there were there was definitely negatives. Serbia fiola shqiptarë dhe nuk ju lejua shkullimi në gjuën e tyre, e kombëve tjera po, e tjive tjera po, gjatë pushtimi të të marë. Yeah, this is a strange, a strange fact, and I've never seen a detailed analysis of it. Um, I mean, it, it, it may be partly because the, the churches, well, the churches were relatively weak. The Catholic Church did have some schools, but of course it, it wanted to teach in Italian because most of the priests came in uh, from, from Italy. Uh, the, the, in the south, the Orthodox schools wanted to teach in Greek. Um, the, the ulema, the, the, the educated class of Albanian Muslims, uh, had their own culture which they had acquired, which was uh, in, mm. in Ottoman Turkish and for the elite also reading in Arabic. And I think there was not a dense enough network of urban society in, certainly not in Albania, mm -hmm. to support the sort of educated middle class that was developing in towns in places like Serbia, Bulgaria and Greece. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, education was not itself um, uh, a, a serious business of the Ottoman state. The Ottoman state was not responsible for setting up schools and making education happen. It depended on other factors, um, but I think there was a sort of cultural prejudice against Albanians uh, using their language, and this is a, a somewhat mysterious factor which I, I, I cannot explain. But no one at the top. I have past benefited Rajoni pri pushtimi të Ottoman, flas për uh, aspekt in ekonomik, infrastrukturor, uh, kulturor gjatë pushtimit, për shkak se uh, dy janë qështjet pra që janë shpjegu nga historia shqiptare para, që turqit pra Osmanet uh, kanë pas një urejt jetë malë ndaj shqiptarëve dhe redhe mirë gjuhës shqipe dhe nuk nga kanë lanë më shkollu ndryshe për i kombeve tjera në gjuhën ton dhe dyta, dhe gjatë pushtimit 500 vjeqar, realisht vendi ka dal njët i prapambetur si që ka qenë ma herët dhe këta shpesh e bojnë një krasim mes pushtimit italian, ku me gjithat nërtohen disa rrug dhe e, godina të rëndësish me sheshe, dhe kohën e prejudhës Osmane, ku asgjo po thujë se si pas shpjegimit historisë tonë nuk u bo nga Osmane. Pavarësi që administruan këtë vanë për 500 vjetë. Yes, as I said, I think Ottoman, the principles of Ottoman rule were in some ways quite light. They wanted to extract mm -hmm. some money and some men. And beyond that, they did not have strong interests in creating a new imperial society. They were not very good at uh, promoting economic development. They understood trade, and um, there were some, uh, some uh, improvements to some of the cities uh, on the coast that did, uh, that did trade and produced customs revenues for the state. But inland, they were much less interested. Uh, as I said also, in Albania itself, um, there was not a great network of significant towns. Uh, Kosovo actually was more urban in the concentration of towns, um, but the trade was mainly just passing commodities down to the coast. 
um, and the revenue collection was, was more likely to happen at the coast. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see a, a, a sort of deliberate hostile policy there. I just see the light touch of a rather neglectful empire. Um, but I would say there are other parts of Eastern Europe not under Ottoman control where conditions in the countryside probably had not improved a lot over the same period. Um, we should not make comparisons with, you know, the modern imperial history of, uh, you know, the British Empire or the French Empire, uh, and perhaps not with the Roman Empire either. Um, every empire is of its own kind, and in some ways the Albanians benefited from that lightness of policy. Uh, imagine if the Ottomans had had a much more positive program of Ottomanization. Would people speak Albanian today? It's possible they would, over 500 years, have lost their language. So it's very difficult to make these judgments going back over half a millennium. Um, there's a kind of hypothetical speculation, and after a certain point, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to be certain of what, what one says on that basis. Okay, e përmendë më herët çështjen e konvertimeve. Në fakt kjo është tema absolutisht më më e diskutueshme. Dhe diskutimet e zakonshme për ajon nëse shqiptarët e kanë pranu fen islame vet, pra si zgjidhet shqiptarët u konvertuan masivisht në fen islame gjatë pushtimit osman apo e bën me dhun këtë konvertim. Dhe e dyta qështje, nëse mund flasin specifikisht për shqiptarët e Kosovës, u konvertuan nga feja katolike, apo nga feja ortodokse në islam? Well, the first question about force, the general answer, I think, is clear from a lot of good historical analysis based on documents in the Istanbul archives and other kinds of evidence? The answer is no. Force was not a significant factor. Very exceptionally, in some cases, after a revolt, an area might have sort of pacification measures, which could include, at least on paper, um, making people convert. But these were absolute exceptions. This was not the normal thing. There are many studies of Islamicization um, in the early Ottoman period. It's a very complicated subject. The general impression is that it was almost always voluntary, that the reasons, the motives for individuals may have been more uh, social, and financial to some extent because non-Muslims paid another tax, the famous, famous haraj or jizya. But don't forget that when you became a Muslim, you paid zakat, the, the arms tax, which was formalized, um, and Christians did not pay that. Um, I think social, uh, I won't say pressures, but social incentives sometimes. If a member of your family had become a Muslim and uh, had had a good career and had influence, you might want to join him to benefit more from his, uh, his, his help and his support. Um, when a group of people in a village had converted, some of the others might want to, to join them if they were the dominant group. Um, certainly the tax question at some times became a kind of financial pressure because although I think the general system was not heavily against Christians, um, at times of war, for example, they introduced special taxes. These would fall mostly on the, 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 the non-Muslim people. So there are various factors. Now, the one factor that I'm not uh, including very much is what we would think of as a religious motive. Um, we, when we think of people converting today, we think almost entirely about religious belief. And this, I think, is anachronistic if we try to analyze the period of uh, Ottoman Islamicization. 
we know very little about what people believed, but religion generally was, it was a kind of uh, social loyalty to your community, and it was a kind of magic. You wanted to have prayers from a priest if your crops were failing in a dry summer. You wanted prayers uh, when your, your father was sick in bed. Now, Islam could supply that magic too. Um, any religion at that period depended very heavily mm -hmm. on people wanting these kinds of, I say magic, it's a simple word, but you know, these kinds of benefits which they perceived. So it was not such a huge change in practical terms, and I don't think it required people to have beliefs about, you know, do I believe in the Trinity or not? This is a very modern attitude. So I'm sorry, that's a long answer to your first question. Force, no. Conversions in, of Albanians in Kosovo, yes, I think they came from both Catholics and uh, Orthodox. Um, there were more Catholics generally, but there were Orthodox Albanians in parts of, 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 of Kosovo as well. And in some cases, the reasons involved in another factor... Do you want to ask about the Catholic and Orthodox Catholic and Orthodox Catholic? Or do you want to ask about that? Do you have a specific reason for the Catholic and Orthodox Catholic and the Orthodox Catholic? Well, broadly speaking, the Catholic element is stronger in the West. Um, the area of... of um, well, from Prisren going up to Peja, um, the, 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 the Catholic element is stronger there. People think of Peja perhaps now as a sort of orthodox centre because of the, the Serb Patriarchate, but in fact, you look at the population returns, um, the orthodox were a small minority in Peja. It was much more a Catholic, a Catholic city. Um, but the other factor, which I didn't mention before, if people lacked Christian priests, that was a major reason for changing religion. Because the priests were the people who did the magic. I put it crudely, but it was like that. And it was very difficult for the Catholic Church to keep up the supply of priests to these places that for them, organizing this in Rome were very remote and difficult. Conditions were not good. Uh, these were very poor places. And quite often, I've worked in the archives in the Vatican and in Rome, you see complaints, we are not getting priests. We cannot survive without priests. Our people are going over to Islam because they are not receiving priests. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was quite an important factor at times. Um, and to a lesser extent, I think that was also true among Orthodox Albanians. I'm <laughs> edhe zhvillimin pas taj të kriptokatolicizmit në Kosovë, një dëguri e hapur, edhe shumë e shprehur në Kosovë për vite e për vite, ndoshta deri në, në periudën modernë. Si e shini zhvillimin e kriptokatolicizmit në Kosovë, që sa diune nuk ka qeni shprehur në Shqipëri farë, pra po është gogja veçanti e Kosovës. Yes, that's... An interesting question. I mean, there are some cases, some villages in Albania where there were crypto-Orthodox mm -hmm. Albanians, but the crypto-Christians in Kosovo were all from the Catholic side. Um, and again, I think the main reason is the lack of priests <coughs> in an important period which also involved periods of very active warfare, revolt against the Ottomans, <coughs> but warfare, the Ottoman state, against Catholic powers. Um, the increase in taxes at that time, I'm thinking particularly of the um, 17th century. And I think these factors led <coughs> to a significant shift towards um, crypto-Catholicism uh, in parts of Western Kosovo, and some parts in the south, Yaniev, that, that, that area. <coughs> now, it's a very interesting phenomenon. At the beginning, it's clear that it involves a very interesting gender divide. The men who go outside the house, have the public life, um, they convert on the surface 
to Islam. They have Muslim names, they go to the mosque. <coughs> the women do not. And the continuity of the crypto-Christianity depends on the women in the home. They are the ones who pass it on to their children. Mm -hmm. uh, and their daughters will remain non-Muslim. Now, this is made possible by Muslim law, which, where it's perfectly legal for a Muslim man to have a non-Muslim wife, but not the opposite. Um, so in a curious way, this phenomenon is made possible, its continuity over generations is made possible by, by Islamic law. The difficult question to answer is, down many generations, when the Catholic Church eventually stopped visiting these houses, because in the early 18th century, the Pope issued a decree saying this is all wrong, you know, they must be proper Christians, priests are forbidden to give them the sacraments and so on. After that point, the interesting question is, what was the nature of this Christianity that they were practicing, they were following? Christianity, Catholic Christianity, without the sacraments, without priests, without the mass, is very difficult without instruction from priests as to what they were meant to believe. I think it became eventually a sort of formula, a formulaic kind of identity, which made them special, which made them a little community among themselves. But I think it's probably anachronistic to say that when they came back and announced themselves as Catholics in the 19th century, or even the 20th, that they had been sort of, so to speak, normal Catholics all through those centuries. I think everything changes over time. Në qështje tjetër, po ashtu e diskutushme, do shta jo aqë, po nga një herë edhe po, sa konvertimet është edhe beteja Kosovës. Histografia shqiptare, thot pra që pjesmarës në beteje në Kosovës kanë qenë edhe shqiptarët. Histografia serbe, nuk e njërën komplet këto, në fakt, dhe nuk e thekson askun që shqiptarët kanë marë pjesë. Nërko, ka një luft, për themi, mes dy historianëve shqiptarë dhe atyre sërbë, rrethë asaj se kush ka qenë vrasësi i Sultan Muratit. Sërbë të thonë që ka qenë Milosh Obilici, ndërsa histografia shqiptare fletë për Milosh Kopilici, nga fshati Kopilici Skenderajt. Që ka mund të thonë ju për këto? Well, on the first point, um, there is clear evidence that Albanians were present uh, on the anti-Ottoman side uh, at the Battle of Kosovo. Um, however, again, I have to warn against anachronism. We're not talking about sort of national contingents representing something like a modern nation state. Um, the way armies were assembled in that period was very different. There were lords who could command so many hundred men, so many thousand men. Their personal interests, loyalties could be decisive in whether they took their men to a battle or not. Um, so yes, there were, there were Orthodox um, Slavs fighting against the Ottomans. There were Orthodox Slavs fighting for the Ottomans. This we also know. Um, and so it was a rather mixed picture, but um, it's clear that there were Albanians uh, on the anti-Ottoman side. As for <clears throat> the person who killed the Sultan, I think in the end we don't have enough solid evidence to make a definite conclusion here. Um, I, I, I'm not convinced we have enough evidence to make a particular identification with an individual from Skenderai. Um, the name itself is suggestive and it's been pointed out that um, this Kobil element in the name is probably the word Kopil, um, uh, which is a sort of Vlach or Al Albano Vlach word that is also very uh, mm -hmm. potentially significant. Um, but in the end, you know, a battle is a battle. Things happen. If one man didn't kill him, perhaps another one would have. I cannot see that it, it matters hugely to, to 
you know, have a great national argument about the national or ethnic origin of this, of this individual. Mm -hmm. um, it's a decisive moment for the history of Kosovo, of course, so it matters, everything in the past matters. Um, but even if that battle had never happened, there would have been other battles or mm -hmm. other methods of long-term conquest. The idea that if, if the Christian side had had a victory, a decisive victory, the idea that you know, Kosovo would never have been conquered by the Ottomans, I think is absurd. You know, this was a superpower on the move, westwards, northwards. It would have extended its power sooner or later. And of course, the battle itself was, was not decisive either way. Uh, but it's just, it's very important in symbolic terms, uh, but it, it, it was a kind of draw between two exhausted sides. And it's only the long-term strategic consequences that make us interpret it as, as an Ottoman victory. Serbet e kanë i arë zakonisht rëndësishëm për të e në Kosovës, vidov donin. A ka qenë gjithmonë një qështë i shumë rëndësishme e serbe, kjo bëtej, apo është bërë rëndësishme pastaj, pra me qenë se politika e ka përdorë këtë bëtej, duke i portretizu si e beteja më e pike e serbë dhe që të dëshmën ato që farë ata pretendojnë për sot e kësoj dite që Kosova është djepi serbisë. Well, I have done some research on this and I think it's clear that this cult of Vidov Dan cult of Lazar, the cult of the sort of martyrdom of, of, of Serbia and um, his famous speech in the poem about better to sort of die um, in a glorious, you know, die with honor and so on, that this is a much later invention. Um, yes, there were some popular songs about the battle and about uh, the death of Tsar Lazar and so on. There were popular songs about almost every major event after they happened. But if you look at the earliest versions of those songs, they do not have this, this national significance. They do not, they do not present it um, as a sort of national tragedy. They're talking about the heroism of an individual uh, fighter in a, in a battle. Vidov Dan, this saint, uh, is um, now associated with the the date of the battle, but the day of the battle, but this saint was added to the Orthodox calendar in Serbia in the 19th century. Nobody was celebrating Vidovdan until then. Um, the, uh, the, the, the other uh, claims about a sort of continuous tradition of celebration of this day, these fall away when you look at them in detail. So yes, this was an ideological development of the 19th century mm -hmm. in a specific political context when Serbian intellectuals were developing their national case for freedom from Ottoman rule and building up their own retrospective account of battles against the Ottomans and their own account of permanent national liberation struggles. Um, and I think the evidence is clear that the when Serbs say, oh, you know, this has been essential, fundamental to our identity for 600 years and more, um, historically that is simply not true. E përmende më herët, skëndërbeon të luftrat që kanë bërë shqiptarët për pavarësi, duhet ndalëm pak të figura e skëndërbeot, ka krysisht viteve të fundit për një diskutim për ato se qëfar është Skënderbeu, krysisht prej grupeve ekstremiste islamike, pra cilë të shojnë Skënderbeu në si shumë figur të krysher, në një anë, e në anë në tjetër, edhe si një figur të hiperbolizuar nga historia e periudës diktatorit të nverë hoxha. Si e shini ju figur në Skënderbeu? Well, he is an absolutely major figure in the history of the 
early Ottoman period in the Balkans. There is no doubt about this. As I said, he became the most famous anti-Ottoman fighter in the whole of, of Europe, was referred to in books written about him as far away as France. <clears throat> so he's a figure of great historical significance. I cannot see a justification for attacking him on modern sort of Islamic grounds. I think this is massively anachronistic and, and really irrelevant. This is not a serious way to talk about 15th century history in Europe. It's always possible to have a debate about his motives, <coughs> about his, mm -hmm. his, um, his interests, um, his aims. Um, as I'm sure you know, there was a, a big debate in Albania some years ago when uh, Oliver Schmidt uh, published his big biography of, of Skanderbeg. Uh, Professor Schmidt is a, a real expert on medieval Albanian history. He had studied the original documents. And he said, well, there is a particular political background to his revolt to do with the position of his father who had been sort of losing his, his traditional power in the territories where he had been the major landowner and the major political figure. This is part of the background. And um, he said some other things about uh, Skanderbeg's family background as well, that it was partly orthodox. And I mean, all of that was known by all serious historians, had been known for, for generations. And there was a rather absurd reaction of people uh, saying, oh, this is a terrible attack on, on Skanderbeg. No, it's not an attack. This is new interpretation of the kind that, that happens all the time with in, in serious history. Um, and it doesn't change the fundamentals, which is that this man fought wars against the Ottoman ruler for decades. Um, so I think, I, you know, I don't see there's any reason to doubt the essential nature of our understanding of Skanderbeg as a leader of major revolts against Ottoman power. Ashtë i përbolizuar figura ti prej historianëve të kohës e diktaturës shqiptare edhe cili ka qenë uh, dikimin fakt i uh, historiografisë shqiptare gjatë prej udhës uh, uh, diktatorit Hoxha. Qysh e shini këtë, këtë prej udhë? Well, I mean, the Albanian culture and sort of intellectual culture generally under Enver Hoxha suffered terribly uh, for obvious reasons. The, the um, uh, elimination of proper contacts with the rest of the world was made it almost impossible for academic research. Very, very rare for any historian to be permitted to go to a foreign archive to do work. Um, this is fundamental. Having no access to the latest books published in Western countries, this was fundamental. So the basic conditions were terrible to, to, of, of, of all research. But for historical research, of course, everything was subjected to the demands of ideology and propaganda. I think probably the further back you went from the present, and this is true generally about communist uh, his history, the further back you went from the present, the easier it was to do sort of serious objective study. Um, so it was probably easier to do work on Roman archaeology under Hodja than it was to do serious work on 19th century or early 20th century political history. But the ideology was plain. It was dictated from, you know, principles of Marxism, Leninism. Um, the, and it's distorted understanding, not just about everything being a struggle for national liberation, but also all this language of, you know, the feudal, the feudal oppressors. Everything was both for national liberation and for social liberation against the feudal. Uh, but, you know, this word feudal, Karl Marx uses it because he's talking about Northern Europe where you have a feudal system. It's very different uh, with Ottoman, the, the Ottoman system. Um, and so the, 
th th it, it was a combination of two very powerful factors which do damage mm -hmm. to um, proper history. Um, the communist view and the nationalist view. Uh, and of course, in some ways, these can diverge. Many anti-communists were very strongly nationalist, but communism absorbed a nationalist ideology as well, simplified it, um, and turned this into a sort of fixed script which, which every historian was obliged to follow. So, uh, having said all of that, I should say, extraordinarily, there were really good and serious scholars who managed still to do good research, um, publish important work. Mm -hmm. The small number who were permitted to go to Istanbul, who could read Osman Lija uh, in the original manuscripts, these people did some fundamental work. And there were others who, who, who were doing serious research, but under terrible, terrible limitations. Vila të pjus specifikisht, pra, për dalë nga një qështin në tjetërën, uh, për ta shfridzuar pranin të uj maksimalisht për ti uh, diskutu disa prej qështjeve që unë thash në krytë herë, si janë vazhdojnë me qenë të diskutu shme të këne. Dua të pjus specifikisht për dy personalitete të rëndësishmet historis të re uh, shqiptare. Pra, me të zogun, fillimisht, e pas taj edhe për Enver Hoxhen. Që që shë këto figura në historin uh, shqiptare ju? Well, if I have to make a comparison, I would say that uh, Zogu was um, clearly the better of the two, um, but he was a flawed man uh, with serious weaknesses, and uh, his legacy is very mixed. But Zogu was... Um, Essentially, he was trying to be a modernizer. He was trying to modernize a society which seemed very traditional, very undeveloped economically, in mentalities, and so on. And he put a lot of energy into social reforms, um, trying to get investment, trying to improve infrastructure, um, trying to change um, public health policies, um, sending his sisters around the country uh, dressed in all their Western dress to persuade women it's not necessary to wear a veil in the street. You know, we forget some of this because we take it for granted now. But um, he was a modernizer, a little bit like Ataturk in Turkey, but I think less, um, uh, less oppressive. I mean, Ataturk really used his power, sometimes in quite ruthless ways. Zogu did not have that degree of power. But uh, it's part of a generation of politicians in that period of the 20th century um, that this is what they saw their main program. And uh, fundamentally, I think the intentions of that program were very good. Of course, he wanted foreign investment for that. And this drew him into the, uh, the gravitational field of Mussolini. And Mussolini saw his opportunity and he saw some weakness in Zog, and uh, he ended up by, mm -hmm. by taking over much of the economy and then, of course, invading. Um, so the record is, you know, is not a happy one. Um, but uh, there it is. It's, it's a mixed record, but I think a very interesting one. There have been good historical studies. I'm sure there will be more. So it's not difficult to make a comparison with a man like that and a man like Enver Hodja. Um, Hodja was um, a creature of Moscow. Uh, he was not a great political thinker or activist. In the first part of his career, he was a puppet of Moscow. Uh, I'm putting it rather strongly, but the documents prove this. He was told what to do. Um, he was told by, by agents sent to him from, from Moscow, uh, Dushan Mugosha, um, Popovich, these were, were just agents who gave him his instructions. And he used elements of nationalist, Albanian nationalist rhetoric, naturally, against an occupying force of Italians or Germans. That was the obvious rhetoric to use. But at the end of the war, 
if, Mo if Moscow had said, now you must forget about an Albanian national state and you must just become part of some new sort of Balkan Soviet, he would have said yes, because all through his career he had been promoted on the basis of saying yes to what Stalin wanted. Um, and then the rule that he actually had, um, well, I don't need to repeat the obvious. It um, destroyed the freedom of the Albanian people. They were held like prisoners in their own country. They were prevented from contact with all sorts of positive developments in the rest of the world. Um, it's, 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 it was a really terrible legacy. And it's impressive that, you know, in the years since the end of communism, Albanians have changed so much to free themselves from that legacy. Duhet kalin të veprat tuaj, pra edhe konkretisht nalëm të kë më famshja për ne, që është Kosova, historie shkurëtër, libri juj. Ju gjatë viteve të djeta kini qenë gazetar, pas taj në nënë djeta i ktheheni profesionit tuaj të historianit, duke shkruar librin për Bosin, e pas taj në nënë djetët tetin, librin për Kosovën. Ishte lufta e Bosnjës që ju bëri të interesoshit për rajonin, pra a ishte edhe libri për Kosovën rrëdhimisht pasoj e asaj që shkruat për bosin, si ndodhë interesimi juj për rajonin? Well, I am often asked this question, and sometimes people say, do you have an Albanian grandmother? Um, the answer is, un <laughs> unfortunately, no. Um, <laughs> internet, <laughs> uh, Well, anyway, um, uh, I can't give a short answer to your question, but I will try. Um, uh, you said I was a journalist. Before I started my career as an academic at Cambridge University, I taught there uh, as a professor for, for seven years. And then I became a journalist, in fact, because I wanted more time to do my, my research, and the, job, the teaching job was very full-time teaching. So I became a journalist in order to continue my academic work. Now, my academic work was primarily on a completely different subject, which was the history of philosophy. But I always had an interest in the Balkan regions, and this started when I was a graduate student. Um, I traveled to Balkan countries. Um, I found that at Cambridge, my university, there was what they called a language laboratory where you could just go. There were courses with cassettes. You put on the headphones. Mm -hmm. you, you could take a course just solo and learn a language. So I started each academic year, I would learn a Balkan language. And in the summer, I would travel there for as long as possible. Um, I love mountains, mountain walking, so I just found there was this marvelous part of Europe with beautiful mountains and <laughs> interesting... <laughs> well, uh, I'm trying to remember. Um, I, I did come to Kosovo before I learned Albanian. So, I mean, I started with, I think, modern Greek, then mm -hmm. Turkish, then serbo croat then Romanian. Um, it was difficult to learn Albanian at that time. In this wonderful language laboratory, there was no teach yourself Albanian course. It did not exist. And so after I'd learned other languages, I began to be irritated. There was this very interesting part of the Balkan map, and I cannot speak that language. So I went to a library, I found a book, just teach yourself in the old-fashioned way. So it was one of the later uh, languages I learned. But I did visit Kosovo in the late 1970s, um, because then I had learnt serbo croat um, So I travelled around Kosovo a few times. Then when I was a journalist, um, I started writing about events in the Balkans. I came to Gazimestan in 1989. I wrote a big article about Milosevic's speech there. Um, and then when the war started in Bosnia, I was writing commentaries, analysis. There were many um, propagandists for Belgrade in the British media. I got into many arguments with them. And I decided I would write a book 
because there were so many false claims and myths about Bosnia, and it was necessary to provide some objective history to, to counter those. And while I was writing the book about the history of Bosnia, which came out in the war in 1994, while I was writing it, I thought, when I finish this, I, I really need to write a similar book for Kosovo. Mm -hmm. Because here are two cases, okay, the details are different between Bosnia and Kosovo, but the basic similarity is that here are political disputes, terrible disputes which will lead to warfare, but almost mm -hmm. every point that is made is a, a claim about history. It's not just a claim about some present-day policy. So many of these claims go back to history in the past. And so I thought it's very important. So as soon as I finished the Bosnia book, I went back to the library and started doing research uh, on the history of Kosovo. So, and then luckily, I, I mean, I was, to be honest, don't tell my Bosnian friends this, but to be honest, the history of Kosovo is a much better book than the history of Bosnia, because I had more time. The Bosnia book, it was in the middle of the war. I had to work very fast and publish it. Bosnia was being destroyed. Mm -hmm. For Kosovo, I had more time. I could go to many archives, do much more original research, read all the secondary literature. Uh, so I felt much more confident of that book. And luckily, it came out in 98, so just before the war in Kosovo. And I feel, in retrospect, that was very lucky because you know, politicians in the West, they then had a book where they could look at. As events were beginning to happen in the war in Kosovo, they could take some book that was easily available in the English language and they could read about um, these Serb claims from an objective point of view. In fact, Libriwe is fantastic. In Kosovo, there are many people who are in the past, but I në 98 e atëher ku fillu në flak të luftës këtu, pas taj besoj më njerën pas luftës është për këtu ndër librat e parë dhe është fantastik, ajo që mund ka bo përshtypje shumë, pra shkolla jonë, mësimi që bëhet, pra dhe për mu ka qenë kjo shumë interesantë në librin Kosova në kure kom ledzu si student, pra në vitin 2000, është që historia jonë në shkolla është mëso deri të vëtisht Skanderbeu, dhe pastaj u shpalë pavarësia e Shqipëris nga Ismail Qemali. Komplet aja për ju dhe është e zbrazët. Dhe ju e keni ndërtu ashtu librin, sa për mu ka qenë fantastike, pra me pasë sa shumë gjarje ka pasë në këtë për ju dhe shumë gjarë kohore, e cilë nuk është përfshi në historinë tonë. Por, ju keni thonë me një vend që keni dashtë me shkru edhe për ta të shkatruar mitët serbe që janë për Kosovën. Kur një balafaqu me mitët serbe për Kosovën, pra gjatë periudhëve të të djeta, pra kur keni punu dhe si gazetar, apo gjatë periudhës ma vënshme, kur fillani me shkru edhe për Bosnjën edhe për tjeret? Well, difficult to say, I mean, when I learnt the languages of different Balkan countries, you know, I am an academic, that's my essential nature, I suppose, so I didn't only learn them in order to travel and to talk to people, you know, in cafes or bus, mm -hmm. bus stations. Uh, I learnt also to read serious history books, and so when I could read Serbian, I went to the library, I read books about history, uh, when I read, learned Romanian, I went to the library, I read books about Romanian music, which is one of my interests. Um, so yes, I became aware all through this period um, of the tendencies of these uh, ideological historians in Belgrade. But of course, what made it an urgent matter to examine closely if there was any justification for what they said this was, was war, war in Bosnia, and then the prospect of war in, in Kosovo. And the fact that these Serbian historical arguments had been instrumentalized by Milosevic um, in his sort of propaganda machine. And a propaganda machine that was, at first, very successful. 
um, because there was so little knowledge of both Bosnia and Kosovo uh, in the world outside. And some of the Western academic publications about the Balkans were written by Western academics who were not propagandists, but they had trained in Belgrade. Mm -hmm. they, their intellectual formation came from their teachers and their friends in Belgrade. They had read essentially Serbian history. Of course, none of them had read Albanian history because they could not read the language and very little Albanian work had been translated. So there was a big sort of natural bias even among the Western historians who were not consciously biased, but it was just there. So I became very conscious of this. I mean, finally, I would just say, you quote me as saying I wanted to destroy Serbian myths. Yes, but I did not actually write a history book to be a propagandist myself. Um, the job of a historian is to destroy all myths. Um, and you asked me at the beginning, were there some Albanian myths? And yes, I, I've tried to show where I think the evidence does not support something that many Albanians have believed. I have said that too. But I think it is a simple fact that uh, statistically, I could say, the great majority of myths relating to these countries are on the Serbian side. Um, it, it, there's no symmetry there. It is, it is massively uh, a question of Serbian myth-making uh, in Serbian history. You deliberately go so far, Mary, to suggest that we study the monasteries of Serbia in the Kosovo, just to show us how many pieces of history of Kosovo. So, Cob, plot, for the mere the historian, you watch serious, bro. Shqiptarë që pretendojnë që manastiret ortodokse serbe pra në Kosovë, në fakt kanë qenë manastire shqiptare e që pasta jenë uh, trans, uh, transformuar në manastire serbe. Pra jenë uh, grabitur nga serbet uh, këto manastire cilat kanë qenë të shqiptarve. Cila është e vërteta? Pa, e vërteta është në librin tuj, edhe e shpjegoni uh, gjërë gjatë këtë qështi, po për ju pës për audiencat të edhe treja. Well, I have seen some of these claims, and I have been puzzled by them. Um, there may be some cases where an Orthodox church uh, is a more recent building, and on the same site in the past, there was something that was, say, an Albanian Catholic church. In some cases, that is possible, minor cases. Mm -hmm. But if you look at all the major Orthodox Serb monasteries, we know their histories. We know when they were built. You know, Gracchanica, Gra 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 uh, You know, we have the 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 histories of these buildings. I mean, Gracchanica. You know, we have detailed architectural studies of the you know the style and how this was built, when it was built. Um, so I'm I'm mystified by this claim that they're all somehow you know, just stolen from some pre-existing Albanian um, religious foundation. Mm -hmm. It's not necessary to adopt that sort of argument. Po ta shkru një cëd historin, pra, librin, Kosova, një histori e shkurëtër, cilat do të hiqnit nga libri edhe qka do të shtonit. Dhe në fakt, a kini mënduar për t'ja shtuar për ta ributuar edhe njëherë librin Kosova për t'i shtu pjesë tjera, pjesën e luftës, qëpallis pavarësis, pra periudhen e fundit, këtë 20 vjeqarin, 25 vjeqarin e fundit, i cili nuk është në librin tuj. Yes, um, your first question is easy to answer. There is nothing that I would take out. Um, I hope this does not sound like, like a sort of a boast, but although I had some very hostile reviews from, particularly from Serbs, um, and from one or two historians who had been trained by Serbs, I have not seen a single significant fact or claim in my book 
that has been disproved by, by, by critics. So I'm satisfied that I can keep everything that is in the book. So uh, there's nothing that I would omit. For adding things, well, there is new research all the time um, on many aspects of history. I cannot write a sort of continuous, constantly changing text. And, you know, I have many other books that I am writing or will write. The question about extending the end of the book up to the present, or at least to 2008, yes, I have thought about this um, many times. In principle, it would be a good thing to do. Um, the book, as you said, was it appeared in 98, one year, well, already terrible fighting was happening, but a, a year before the actual NATO war uh, in, in, in Kosovo. Uh, and about three years, no, a little later, two years later maybe, um, I was a visiting professor at Harvard and I was contacted by the editor of New York University Press, which published the American edition of, of the book. And he said, you must write an update, you know, we want an, a second edition. But it was... Um, no, actually, it was just one year later. It was before the end of the war, I think. So, yes, after about one year. And I thought, well, this is so important, so I did write an update. So there is a second edition which takes the story a little further, but it does not even go to the end of the war, and certainly not to 2008 and mm -hmm. independence. But then if I did that, I would need to write much more, probably bring it to the present or much closer, why stop there when we know what has happened for another um, 15 years after that? And there is one thing that holds me back. I try to write a general history from the Middle Ages to the end, late 20th century. Every time I add another chapter at the end, the proportion of sort of modern political analysis to centuries of, of sort of history changes and it looks more and more like some book published by a sort of modern analyst where the earlier stuff can then be seen just as background some sort of background information before we get to the real subject which is an analysis of modern politics and that was not the type of book that I wanted to write I wanted to write something that could last a long time could still be referred to could still be useful for readers after 10, 20, 30 years. And I fear that if it becomes more like just contemporary analysis, it, 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 its character will change. Kosovo <coughs> Do you think Kosovo will be able to do it with Albania? Or do you think we will be able to do it with Albania? Do you think we will be able to do it with Albania? Or do you think we will be able to do it with Albania? Or do you think we will be able to do it with Albania? Or do you think we will be able to do it with Albania? Or do you think we will be able to do it with Albania? Or do you Well, in the present circumstances of the policies and the attitudes of the major Western powers, um, I think unification of Kosovo and Albania is not a practical option. Um, there is too much worry and fear. Some of it founded on very false assumptions, but nevertheless it exists uh, among Western politicians and diplomats. And it would be seen as somehow a very um, risky and destabilizing measure. Um, and what Kosovo needs most of all, what the Western Balkans need most of all, is stability. Um, and we know what the main cause of instability is, and that is um, Belgrade. Uh, so I think the policy for Kosovo now must be just to insist on stability, um, on consolidating the existing state of affairs, which can never be changed back. 
um, but it's still it is threatened with instability from one direction. And this is a message which has to go primarily to the EU, which I'm afraid is in some ways facilitating the Belgrade project. Um, I mean, I think not from a sort of conscious policy against Kosovo, but just from uh, a degree of um, political insensitivity, uh, taking advantage of their friends, um, which is all, these are always the easiest people to take advantage of. So there is a problem, and I think the key for Kosovo is to, to keep up a message of long-term stability where other states in the Western Balkans can agree and should also be lobbying the EU and the US that anything that destabilizes Kosovo destabilizes the whole region. This is a regional issue and the EU should be thinking of it like that mm. and not just thinking, oh, there's some little dialogue going on here and perhaps it will work if we just push Kosovo even harder. I think that's a very mistaken policy. But you ask about the future of Kosovo more generally. Well, we're living in very difficult times now after the invasion of Ukraine. And I think what we're seeing is that the world is becoming rapidly much more polarized. Kosovo is very clearly, has always been very clearly on one side. It's a very pro-Western state. Like Albania, and sort of just in the ordinary culture, um, positive feelings about the United States, about um, Britain, I think, um, about the West. Uh, these are at very high levels, much better than some other countries in Southeast Europe. Um, as the world becomes more polarized, the West will start thinking more seriously about who are its friends and who are not its friends. I will not, to avoid, you know, provocations, I will not quite say enemies, but Belgrade has a very dubious position now, refusing to sanction Moscow, um, keeping up close relations with Putin, um, uh, Vucic going off to, to Beijing for the Belt and Road Conference the other day, not to the meeting of the Western Balkans leaders with, with the EU. Uh, there are clear messages coming out of Belgrade, which are that it seems almost to prefer maintaining its good relations with, with Putin and perhaps also with the Xi of China. Um, in this increasing polarization, uh, one of the strengths of Kosovo is that it is known to be a very pro-Western state. And I think in the long term, when, when things change, perhaps for the worse, that will become more and more important. In fact, I came to the point to the special the fund, but in the disciple of the Serbian report of Kosovo, and Prokoni, Presen bi Kosovën dhe në anën tjetër një favorizim të servis. Tërko, ne kemi pa, mujnë kaluar, pra me 24 uh, shtator, pa të mëdhe një grup terrorist, një agresion të servis bi Kosovën. Pse ndodhë kjo, pra, pse nuk ka një përgjigjit qartë? Kusht, kusht problemi? Ashtë problemi të këne Kosovar që s'po artikulohëm uh, si duhet në përëndim për Qështjen, apo ka vërtet një uh, qasje favorizu se ndaj Serbis, si do mos në tavolin e dialogut? Well, I don't think there is any fundamental hostility to Kosovo, but I think there is just a seriously mistaken policy strategy. I say strategy, I think it's more than just short-term tactic. It is a policy strategy. It's based on the idea that um, Serbia is in some ways the most important of the states in the Balkans. Uh, I think that is very questionable. It's based partly on the idea that Serbia is desperate to join the uh, European Union and that in the long term this incentive must have the effect and so 
in some ways they take for granted the long-term cooperation of Serbia, I think that is very doubtful. Um, and it's based on the idea that if they just try to push what they call these, these technical agreements uh, and what they think of as a sort of a number of technical dialogue issues between Belgrade and Pristina, that doing more and more of this will bring with it a new spirit of cooperation, a new spirit of normalization between the two, and that by just keeping to these relatively low-level issues, you build up a different psychology where Serbia will accept Kosovo as an equal. And that is completely mistaken. And we see it's mistaken because Serbia has its own agenda. Uh, it has its own agenda on all three of those things, plus, as I said, its strong connections with Moscow. I think there will come a point when the EU will need to say to Belgrade, look, you have a choice. Do you want eventually to join the EU or do you want to maintain your claim over the territory of Kosovo? You cannot have both. You must choose between those two. Now, I don't believe they have put the question as simply as that yet to Serbia. But as their attempts to manipulate Serbia on these false assumptions continue to fail, and even after giving concession and concession one after another to Serbia, they see that they fail, they're not getting the result they want, eventually they will have to ask that question. Um, and if Serbia says, well, we would rather just um, maintain our claim to Kosovo, at that point, the EU can stop trying to please Serbia because it knows it's getting nowhere with those tactics. Mm -hmm. Then it can try a completely different strategy. Shvar ka ndodhë Kosovë, pra realitetin e kryum me 17 shkur 2008? I think in theory it is possible to have peace without recognition, but that applies only in a situation where the political leadership in Serbia and perhaps the sort of political class more generally in their hearts accept the reality accept the fact that a scenario where Kosovo becomes just a province of Serbia again is completely impossible. It will never happen. You know that, I know that, they know it in London, in, in Washington, in Paris, even in Brussels they know that, and even in the five uh, EU countries that do not recognize Kosovo, I think they know that. If they really understood that in Belgrade and accepted it and changed their underlying psychology, then it might be possible to have peaceful relations, the kind of situation that they aimed at when they tried to copy the old agreement between West Germany and East Germany. Um, these things might be possible. But I said that is a theoretical situation. It does not apply to the, the political leadership now in Belgrade. Um, so my answer in relation to the real existing situation is no, I think you will not have full peace between the two without the basic recognition of the independence of Kosovo. And that is a very unfortunate fact, but the responsibility for it lies entirely on Belgrade. E fundit, ju e keni një liber voluminoz për filozofin anglez të shekullit 17, Thomas Hobbesin. Hobbesin njëhet për përshkrimet e ti të një bote ku në bisu ndën uh, paliqmeria, dhuna, lufta, e gjithve, pra me gjithu se uh, një bote të mershme. Nëse shojmë gjarjet në Ukrajin, pra agresionin rus në Ukrajin, tashe dy vite, luften atje, konfliktin, e fundit në lindje në mesme, konkretesht në Gaza. A keni frikë që përshkojmë drejt këti vizionit hopsit, pra këti përshkrimit botës, si që ka bo hopsit, për cilin ju e keni, e keni këtë liber, fakt, e keni një liber fantastik. 
Arda. Well, thank you. The, the argument Hobbes was making when he gave his famous description of what he called the state of nature, uh, the natural state of mankind, uh, war of all against all, life of man nasty, poor, brutish and short, he was describing a theoretical existence without a state, without laws, uh, without any political framework uh, where people... He was trying to illustrate how important it is to live within a stable state where you do have laws, you have justice, uh, where society can grow in that, in that framework. However, he said this does not exist in the real world, Everywhere we live in societies, we have political authority. But there is an approximate analogy to what I'm describing here, and that is the relationship between states, so international relations. Yeah. Now, he was not saying international relations are totally a state of war. He wrote about treaties and alliances, about how it was good practice to develop um, a kind of international law framework as well. But he said that, in the end, when one state wants to fight another state, well, there is no super state over them to, to tell them to stop. And it will come down to, to force in the final analysis. So this is a truth that has been with us for the whole of human history. And tragically, we're seeing it happen now in Ukraine. Um, and with slight variations, of course, what... what, what um, uh, you know, the very specific situation uh, with Israel and Palestine. Um, but I don't think it's a reason to feel that, um, you know, we can never have stability. Um, European states, generally, uh, the states that we now call the West, have had stability since the Second World War. There is no reason why they should go to war among themselves. Um, the future of Kosovo lies in that Western block of stable democracies, um, and I'm confident that the future of Kosovo will, will be fulfilled there. You fall in the race, Shum, for a cut interview. Thank you. Thank you.